Father, we thank you that we are yours. Lord, we're thankful that, Lord, in spite of what we are, Lord, in spite of where we've been, in spite of what we've done, in spite of what we've said, Lord, even when we've hurt you and we've disappointed you and we've let people down, and Lord, most importantly, we've let you down and we've broken the hearts of our mothers, God, we're thankful that you loved us anyway. Lord, you gave us a place at the table. Lord, you gave us a place in, Lord, you. God, I'm thankful for that. Lord, I know that I'm unworthy of that, but Lord, I'm thankful that you gave it anyway. All this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We had planned to sing another song, but Brother Luke, I don't think the spirit can get better than it is now. And uh, I don't think that we could improve upon what the Lord has already done through you and our musicians. Choir, thank you so much. And praise team and musicians, uh, thank you. Uh, just absolutely wonderful, wonderful day. And again, I, I can't thank you enough for being here, visitors and guests. It's awesome. And uh, just uh, we're, we're, we're thankful. I know it's a little warm. We've got it set on 65, but if you put 400 people in the auditorium, it gets warm. And, uh, and so maybe we need to add another, some window units down the side or something. I don't know, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll figure something are in Valley, so we can use window units. It's okay. And, uh, and so, uh, did you like my joke there? I thought, I thought that was well played. Um, Matthew chapter number 15, Matthew chapter number 15. Um, <clears throat> I, I just, these special days, I get so excited. I can't hardly sleep at night. Like I wake up all through the night. I'm thinking about my sermon. I'm thinking about what I'm going to get to talk about. I'm thinking about who's going to be there and how we can be a blessing to you and your life. And, uh, and so, you know, while we're preaching in English, we have several people sitting across the auditorium that have an earpiece in. If you're sitting by somebody that has that, they're listening in Spanish. Uh, Brother Adon is back in the coffee shop translating. Uh, don't anybody else get the idea? You can't go to the coffee shop. Um, just Brother Adon can hang out in there. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But mothers, if you do have a crying baby and you need somewhere to go, if you go out the back doors, make a right, there's a little coffee shop there and you can watch on the monitor um, kind of what's going on. And you, if you also need to go to the nursery, um, there's also a monitor in there so you can hear and see what's going on in the sanctuary. But uh, I, I just want to mention that they're hearing in Spanish while we're hearing, hearing in English. But it's exciting just to see uh, just everybody's family. And I've got to meet some of you today that I didn't know before. But I'm so excited about this sermon because I believe it fits well for the the context of Mother's Day, but also I believe it uh, fits very well in many other ways. Now, I don't have any slides up and I don't have any uh, timer on the back. So then I guess that just means I'm unlimited in my times today. So uh, there we go. Uh, isn't that cute? Doesn't that look like a Gerber, Gerber commercial? Didn't I do good on my slides this week? And uh, oh, and, uh, and so I don't think that baby's near as cute as some we saw come in here a while ago. And, um, and so they are uh, absolutely, you know, Brother Luke was giving me a hard time the other day because whenever I see little black Blake, you know, he's around all the time. And I just always am hanging out with Blake. Your music practice, he'll come sit in my office and, and uh, we talk all the time. And, and uh, at least I talk all the time and, and uh, Blake listens sometimes. But uh, um, he just kind of looks at me. But, uh, but you know, uh, when Luke was like, yeah, this is his grandkid. And uh, I guess since Kim has not been willing um, to go for number four, she said no. Um, mother times three is it. Uh, then I guess Blake is my grandkid. So I, I enjoy, but just all these kids and babies, I just love seeing them boy. And, and the excitement. But I think this will be a time today that, that, that we can really put into context and frame this. So Matthew chapter number 15, let's stand if you would out of respect for the reading of God's word. We'll begin in verse number 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Now that's one of my favorite verses. You say, why is that one of your favorite verses? I mean, that brother Mark, I mean, what, what, what is so special about verse number 21? Because Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Because this is the first time that Jesus started going to the Gentiles. The very first time that Jesus left the house of Israel and started going to the Gentiles. Brother Gary, I mean, this gets me excited because I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm a Gentile. Some of you might need to check your birth certificates. You're probably a Gentile too. One, little two, little three, little Gentiles. I mean, we got... A lot of Gentiles in the service this morning. Call your mom if you need to uh, after the service. We are not of the house and lineage of David, right? We're not Jewish people. And this is the first time that Jesus began to go to the Gentiles. And this gave us hope. He grafted us into the family. Now, let's, let's continue reading. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him. I mean, she's broken. She says, have mercy on me, O Lord. Thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. 
And he answered and said unto her, not a word. And, and, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she crieth after us. But then Jesus answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That didn't stop her. He said, hey, I'm not, I'm not here to deal with you. I don't want to talk to you. But here, here's what happens. Then came she and worshiped him. Can I just say this? Even if things are bad in your life, it's always right to worship Jesus. It's always right to worship God. You said, but the bottom's fallen out. Worship him anyhow. When Job lost everything that he had, he fell down and complained. That's not what the book of Job says. The Bible says he fell down and he worshiped. Now, let's, let's continue on. She said, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not me to take children's bread and to cast it to dogs. He called her a dog. I mean, I remember when I was a teenager and I read this, I was like, Jesus is, I mean, he's harsh. Now watch. And she said, truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Father, please, I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, I pray that you would just give us, uh, Lord, just a, an unction to preach, but then, Lord, you would give us your spirit from on high to just invade this place. Lord, we may have some people here that are guests that have not been uh, in a high view service before. Lord, I pray that they would want to come back, and Lord, the service would be appealing to them. But Lord, most importantly today, I pray that your word would be convicting to our hearts. Lord, I'm not aiming to step on people's toes. I'm aiming to speak to their hearts. And so, God, if you would direct me to say exactly what you would want me to say, then, Lord, I'll give you the honor and the praise and the glory for it. All this we ask in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, you can be seated. So Jesus now turns his attention unto the Gentiles because we know what the Bible says in, in the book of John, chapter 1. He said, he came into his own, but his own received him not. And so Jesus began to, as he was turned away, begin to look into the Gentile people. And, and, and we see at a glance that it almost appears as if Jesus is being rude. He's being offensive. But when we dig deeper, there's such an implication here of what Jesus is doing. It is powerful and life-changing. You see, Jesus answers this mother sort of rough. I mean, she has a demon-possessed daughter. I mean, her life is messed up. Her, her, her family is messed up. But Jesus did not call her a dog and give her some silence to destroy her faith. But if you watch this over this few minutes or even few hours that took place, Jesus said this to develop her faith. And you know that all development of film takes place in the dark. And sometimes the Lord has to allow you to come into a dark place so that he can develop you to have a deeper faith and a deeper walk with her and with him. So her faith grows over the hours. She had a faith that was like a junkyard dog that had a hold of a soup bone that would not let go. And he was hungry. And he, I mean, you can't shake it loose no matter what you do. That was the kind of faith that this woman had. So I want to just quickly break down this passage of scripture and let's consider what it says. First of all, I see an agonizing mother. Look in verse number. 22 it says she came and she cried and she said my daughter is possessed with the devil now I know it's Mother's Day but how many of you think that your kids have sometimes been possessed by a devil don't hold your hands up every mom in the place their hand was shooting up and their kids are so embarrassed now I mean uh, I've, I've, I've thought that a few times I've felt that way I have felt like sometimes instead of having a discipline session in our home I should have an exorcism Kids are not always perfect. My kids aren't perfect. And before you say amen, neither are yours. All of our kids make mistakes. All little kids make mistakes. But there's nothing worse than watching a parent whose child has broken their heart and the pain they have in their eyes. There's nothing so real as that. I've, I've had parents sit in this office right down here about, I don't know how many feet away, 100 feet away in my office unless you take the whole route to get there, then it's like 5,000 steps. But, and I've watched tears run down their faces. Their kids have broken their heart. And they're so disappointed. They're brokenhearted. And they don't understand why. This mom is beyond broken because her daughter is possessed by a devil. She is vexed. I mean, I mean she is at the bottom and as a parent, you want to take your kid's pain. I remember the very first time, our very first kid, Mackenzie. Where's Mackenzie at? In the nursery. 
just gonna use her for an illustration. She's not in here, but I'm using her anyway. Kinsey, watch on the monitor right now. I'm talking about you. Mackenzie, first time she got sick, she was about 18 months old. She's just talking. I'm talking about really sick. Our kids were very healthy. Fat kids are healthy and our kids were all fat. And so she got sick. And I mean, she was just crying and her fever, she was burning up with fever. And so I remember what I did. I took her and her favorite movie was Old Yeller. We still have all the old Disney movies and Old Yeller and Savage Sam. Old Yeller, come on home, Yeller. And Davy Crockett, but she wanted to watch Old Yeller. And so we sat in the, on the couch and I remember holding her little body and I was sweating as I was holding her because she was just burning up with fever. And of course she's cold, so I've got her wrapped in blankets and her little hot body up against me and I'm holding her. She's crying. The medicine would kick in and she would sleep and then she would wake up and watch a little bit of Old Yeller and then she would doze back off. And I remember staying up all night with her in there just praying, Lord, if you'll just let me take it, I'll get so sick. Lord, please just heal my little girl. She's so sick. We would take anything from our kids if we could. Imagine what this woman's feeling when her daughter is demon-possessed and all of these things that would go along with that. This mother's broken to the core. Some people give up, but she gave it to Jesus. And some of you have given up on things in your life, but instead of giving up on those things, you need to give them over to Jesus. You've given up on some situations. You've given up on your kids. You've given up on your marriage. You've given up on other relationships. You've given up ever being clean. And you're, you're sticking a needle in your arm and you're smoking pot and you're doing drugs and you've given up on ever getting help. But instead, you need to give that to Jesus because he can set you free from that. She brought it to Jesus. She can't shake this. When she wakes up, she sees it. When she goes to bed, she sees it. All day long, she sees it. It's right in front of her. I think about a man by the name of John. John had a praying mother who told him at age five that he would become a preacher, but instead at age 17, he became a pirate. He was a drunkard. He became a pirate and he began to pirate on the seas. And one of the things that he did, we, you know we're talking in the 1800s, is he became a slave trader. And he began to go to Africa and he began to steal people and separate them from their families and put them on boats and sell them as slaves, as animals, and put them in cages. One time he was even about to be caught by the British Navy and so he took all the, I can't even imagine how wicked this is. He, he chained uh, cannonballs to the chains and he chained all of the people together and he brought them out and told them to jet, step overboard and drown them all in the ocean. And hundreds of people drowned right there. He was so wicked that he fell overboard one time during a storm and to save his life, he was screaming for help. They threw a harpoon and stuck it through his leg and pulled him in. He was even hated by his own crew. He was in a bad deal, that, a deal that went bad on slavery and he was made a slave himself and he cried out to God while he was a slave and later on he was rescued and then saved. And it was him, John, that wrote the words to the song that we sing Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I want John Newton, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And he said this, he said, the only reason that I ever came to faith in Christ was because I had a mother who prayed for me. Have you given up on your circumstances? This agonizing mother, she didn't give up. But not only do I see an agonizing mother, but number two, if you look at verse number 23, we see an amazing master. It says, but he, this is Jesus, answered her, not a word. Now, when you look at this response, this is, this is something. What a God who's gonna perform this miracle. But, but I mean, she says, Lord, I need some help. And he just talked to the hand. I don't have time. Doesn't even answer, just ignores her. And I mean, she comes saying, oh, Jesus, come. Why is this silence so important? I mean, have you ever cried out for help and heard nothing from God? Have you ever cried out for, for something in your life, a healing, a need, and you heard nothing? God gave you nothing? You know what? It's okay because the same thing happened to Jesus. He's hanging on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we may, might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus is dying for the sins of the world. And if you remember what happened to Jesus, Jesus said, God, God, why have you forsaken me? Eli, Eli, lama sabatani speaks to God the Father and God, the Holy Spirit, you see the Trinity addressed by Jesus. But Brother Luke, he says nothing. He gives Jesus silence. Sometimes the silent answer from God is the hardest to take. But if you'll be patient and if you'll be faithful, 
you might see the greatest miracle, the very thing that you thought was impossible for God to do, he'll do it in your life if you'll just be patient and stay faithful. We live in this instant society. We want everything to happen instantaneously. I mean, we want instant coffee. We want to pull up at a drive-thru. We don't want to wait for the meal to be made. We want this. We want that. We want it fast. We want it now. We want it immediate. All of these things that we have, and we want it right now, but sometimes God's timing is better than our timing. In fact, the Bible says this, his ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Look at 23, the second part, it says the disciples even look at what Jesus does and says, okay, just send her away. You know, to understand his silence, we have to see how she approached him. Now, I want you to think about this. Now, you, you gotta stay with me right now. You, 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 this is so important. The implication here is so cool. If you'll just watch with me, you're gonna get a blessing. Here's what happens, Brother Carrie. She comes to him and she addresses him like a Jew, but she's a Gentile. She's never been to the temple. She's never done a sacrifice. She's a Gentile woman. She was never allowed to be around the Jewish uh, worship. So, but she knows, she thinks that she has to act like a Jew to get Jesus to help her. And so she comes and she says, Jesus, thou son of David, she approaches him with a messianic term that the Jews would use. So she tries to approach him as a Jew so that maybe he'll listen. But Jesus doesn't even acknowledge that. Because Jesus is saying, you don't have to be a Jew to come to me. Y'all don't seem near as excited as I do. You don't have to be a Jew to come to me. Oh, listen to what the book of Galatians says. The book of Galatians in chapter three and verse number eight says it's neither Jew nor Greek nor bond nor free nor male nor female. We are all one in Christ. His silence was saying, you don't have to be a Jew. There used to be this song this family sang. It went like this. I stood before the king, or I stood before the Lord, and a king stood by me, and on the other side, a vagabond. And as we knelt at the cross and poured our hearts out to Jesus, he knelt to hear everyone, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. No man stands higher than I. You can call on Jesus' name and a king can do the same. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. You say, but brother Mark, I, you, don't know, you don't know where I was Friday night. You don't know where I was Saturday night. Jesus is saying, hey, I don't care if you're messed up, I'll take you like you are. No greater love hath any man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. So this silence was saying, ma'am, you don't have to come to me as a Jew. You come to me like you are. A lot of people think that, Brother Nate, they gotta fix themselves up. I think maybe some of those guys, that, the guy that you were talking to the other day, and he goes, man, the roof would cave in if I can. He thinks he's gotta fix stuff before he can come to church. What he needs to know is you need to come to church, give your life to Jesus, and then he'll fix stuff. Let Jesus do the fixing, man. You can't turn over a new leaf. You can turn over so many leaves, you wear the leaf out. But if you come to Jesus, you won't get a new leaf. You'll become a new creature. He said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, this is good preaching, even if I'm doing it and y'all are sitting there like you're about to go to sleep. Number two, not only do I see his silence, but I see his statement. I'm the one up here sweating to death. Look at verse 24. This is when he finally answers where he says, I am not sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He says, look, I'm not even coming to you. But there must have been something in the way he said it. And then look what he goes on to say. She comes and keeps worshiping anyhow. She will not quit. Her faith is real. And by the way, this is the historical process. Jesus always went first to Israel, but when they said no, he came to his own, his own received him not. So Jesus went to the Gentiles. Paul, Paul said this, Brother Phil. He said, I will count myself accursed. You can throw me in hell because I want to save Israel. But Israel rejected him. He shook the dust off of his shoes, the Bible says, and he went to the Gentiles. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. There's this historical order taking place. But you see, this didn't discourage this woman because even now that the Jewish thing is over, she catches the point. She gets it. Actually, tap your neighbor on the shoulder and say, she got it because some of y'all aren't getting this yet. 
T.D. Jakes does that and it works really good. They didn't know what to do. Every time T.D. does that, they're like, whoo! I'm gonna have to do more of that. Can I say T.D. Jakes in a Baptist church? Okay. Brenda's with me. <clears throat> now listen to this. So he says, look, I'm not even coming to you. You're a dog. Now, he was not referring, the, the, the Greek word there is not the mean, angry, uh, Brother Johnny, it's not the angry dog like the scavenger, scavenger, but rather it's either a derogatory term to a Gentile or the commentary I read yesterday was so cool because he said it's like a lap puppy, like a dog for, that wealthy people had that they kept in their lap. And so here's what he said. I, I love this. She doesn't get discouraged because he goes, you're nothing but a dog, but it must be the way he said it. Now, um, <clears throat> come here, Wesley. You were starting to doze off. So I thought this would be a blessing to you. And I will call anybody else out that's dozing off too. <clears throat> there's times that Wesley, I say things to Wesley that you might think there's no way that Mark loves his son. You know, like the other day when he broke his teeth out. Smile at everybody because your teeth are not broken anymore. Okay. And I was calling him Fang Face. It was a term of endearment <laughs> because I love him. Now, you're gonna like this, you're gonna like this. Jesus calls her a dog, but she was not offended. You know why? I'm sure that there was this twinkle in her eye as she looked at him and just like Wes, fang face, <laughs> those teeth are hilarious. <laughs> I told him, I said, there's no way they can get anything as yellow as your teeth to match. I was giving him a hard time in the dentist. Like the dentist didn't have to tell him to open his mouth because he's sitting there smiling like this and laughing the whole time. You know what? He doesn't take that as painful because he knows he, he's seeing my language. You know what I'm saying? My body language, even the way that I'm saying it. Now get this. Thank you, Wesley. You can sit down. Don't go to sleep. <clears throat> now get this. This is so important. She jumped right on that. She's like, okay, Lord, I'm a dog. But even the dogs get the crumbs. And she said, I'd rather have Jesus crumbs than have a steak from the devil. I'd rather have crumbs from Jesus because I believe they can change my life. I've already had all the meals the devil has to offer. And look at my daughter. Her life's a wreck. Obviously what Satan has is not good, but Lord, I'll take your crumbs. If that's all I can get, I'll take the crumbs. Some of us, the first time we feel like we're getting a little bit slighted, oh, woe is me. <laughs> We live in such a sensitive society today. The way we used to deal with bullies whenever I was a kid is you punched them in the face. And you say, well, what if you get beat up? Then you hit them with a stick next time. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not being unkind, but I didn't go commit suicide because somebody picked on me. I mean, I told Wesley and Mater got haircuts the other day and Wesley and Mater were both starting to look like puppies. I mean, they had hair everywhere. And so they got a haircut the other day and if mine's a little long, it's because I'm doing this comb over thing and it's really working for me right now. And, and so, but, but they, and so I was like, Wesley, I said, shut the car door. He's like, what? I was like, push your ears back. They're sticking straight out, man, your hair's gone. I was like, your ears, and he's like, oh dad, come on. So he's like, you know, pushing them back. Her faith would not let go. I think about a woman in the Bible, and I'm almost done. This woman in the Bible, her name was Rizpah. I know that's a difficult name, but it's Rizpah. She's over in 1 Samuel. <clears throat> she got caught up in a circumstance that was not her fault. She was a mother, she had two sons, and she had five nephews. And the Gibeonites had been wronged by Saul. And now that David's king, he was trying to make peace with people, but the Gibeonites would not make peace with him. And so they said, how can, you make pe how can we make peace with you? The Gibeonites said, we want Saul, two of Saul's sons killed. Now, he wasn't going to give up Mephibosheth. Couldn't give up Mephibosheth. He was sitting at his table, so he gave up the sons of Rizpah. Wasn't her fault. But both of this mama's boys were killed and hung from a tree on a hill in Gibeah. For five months, this mother stayed by their side and almost died, almost starved to death, literally endured everything. Night and day, she stayed by their side and did not let the buzzards or the scavengers come and attack those bodies. 
Finally, David said, what a shame that a mother has to see her children hang upon a tree, upon a hill. He said, let's bury him as royalty. Her love and faithfulness. But don't let, the, don't let the picture be lost. Don't let the typology be lost. Make sure you text this to Cody Zorn, Luke. Because I also know somebody else who watched her son hang and die on a tree. And her name was Mary. And his name was Jesus. And it was that shame and agony that that mother watched that gave us our freedom in Christ. You know, it means a lot to some people. You know, we got, we got Brother Dick Atherton back there and uh, he, he, he had a hip replacement a week ago, eight days ago. Hip replacement in church today. Even through this long sermon. He's jumped up twice and shouted. No, I don't think he has, but he's waved his cane. Um, it means a lot to some people, but some people, their dog has the mange and I'm out of church. Fifi's sick. You know, send Fifi to the vet and come to church. You know what I'm saying? This mother cared so much. Now, let me give you this last point and we're done. So we've seen this agonizing mother, this amazing savior, but we also see this appealing miracle. This appealing Miracle. I mean, right here, I almost just want to say, hashtag strong faith. Because, I mean, this woman came with no, I mean, no chance of this daughter ever being healed and left with a healed daughter. Verse number 28, it's her constant plea. You know, I think about her faith. Finally, she just laid hold on Jesus and wouldn't let go. I think of some New Testament examples of this. Remember the woman, the widow, who went to the unjust judge? The judge was not a good guy, but finally he answered her plea, not because she could vote him out or she could do it, just because she would not stop coming to Jesus. I think about the, the guy who, was, who needed bread because he had a guest come in town, and so he, he went to his neighbor and he beat on his door and the neighbor was already in bed. And if you've ever seen a Middle Eastern kalat, he got out of the kalat, he came to the door of, of, the, of the, 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 the wall around his house and he came to the door and, and said, what do you want? He said, I need fresh bread. I've had, I've had somebody come and I didn't know they were coming, a surprise guest. And the Bible says that he did not give it to them because they requested it, but he gave it to them because of their importunity. They would not quit. It was their persistence. You know, sometimes we pray once and then we don't see immediate firefall from heaven and we just quit. Let me ask you this question. Will your kids and grandkids be saved because of your prayer life? We prayed over your kids today, but I hope you pray over your kids. I remember when Mason was my last son to be saved. He was saved last summer on a Friday night. And I remember as Mason was my last child to be saved. Now, I still pray for my kids every day. Brother Gary, I'm not joking when I say I would sometimes pray for Mason a hundred times in one day to be saved. God save Mason. God save Mason. God, please save my little boy. God, deal with his heart. God, convict him. Lord, speak to him today over and over and over. What's your prayer life like? We got the old song, when mama prayed, heaven paid attention. Are you praying, mama? Heard this little story, and I, I know it's not true, but it's in a, one of those little preacher joke books. This lady was on the couch, and she was, she was talking to the preacher about how much she loved God, and she looked at her little boy, and she said, honey, go get the book that mama loves so much. And he went and got her the Reader's Digest and brought it back to her. <laughs> Thomas DeWitt. Thomas DeWitt was a contemporary with Spurgeon and Moody. He pastored for 25 years the, the Brooklyn Tabernacle, where Jim Cymbal is at. And, and, and he would preach to 5,000 people a Sunday for year after year. 5,000 a Sunday. Moody said this about him. No one moves my heart to God like DeWitt. No one moves my heart to God. His dad's name was David. David loved to party. Thomas's dad, David, he, he was a party animal. In fact, at age 18, him and his brother and sister had gone to a party and stayed out all night, drunken in debauchery, living in sin. While they're there living in sin, they come home that night at one o'clock in the morning. This story so moved me, I sat in my office and wept as I thought about it. They had an invalid mother. This invalid mother was not able to 
do much at all. In fact, the only thing she said she could do for her kids would be to pray. And so she was weeping for her kids when they came home and they stopped by and they heard their mom weeping in her bedroom, calling their names out to God. By their own testimony, David fell asleep, passed out on the couch. The sister made it to her room and their brother passed out in the barn. Mama was still praying at two. Mama was still praying at three. Mama was still praying at four. Mama was still praying at five and at six o'clock in the morning when the sun started to come up, all three of those siblings, Brother Brad got under conviction right where they were at in different locations and started calling out for mom and dad to come to them. And that mama couldn't walk and she crawled down the hallway to the daughter and the dad went to the couch and took his boy to the barn and all three of them were gloriously saved that morning and accepted Christ as their personal savior. They made a commitment that they would pray for their kids exactly the same way. Thus we have Thomas DeWitt, the preacher that reached thousands and they prayed until Thomas was saved. All five of their children, one was obviously the pastor at Brooklyn Tabernacle, the other four were missionaries and spent their lives serving the Lord. I don't think there could be a greater thing of this heritage than for God to call and use and bless our kids and our families. But it's not gonna happen if we don't pray. Are we men and women of prayer? Mama, if there's one thing you can be known for, it is a prayer warrior. Daddy, you're not exempt today. Do you pray? And do you have the faith to keep praying even when you're not seeing the answers that you wanna see? I'm not gonna go into the testimony deep, but We've got Brother Johnny Wilt here, Brother Gary's son. He now directs a nationwide, he's gonna pray and close our service, but he directs a nationwide addictions program, literally in thousands of churches. Brother Johnny is running from the Lord, doing drugs, living his life, and Brother Gary, Miss Victoria, I don't know how many years and tears that you got on your knees and wept and prayed. God answered your prayers. Aren't you glad you didn't stop a day short or a week short or a month short? Keep praying. Keep praying. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. When no one looking around, I want to just ask a question quickly. Is there anyone here today that would say, preacher, with every head bowed and every eye closed, preacher, I just... When you were talking today, uh, that, that, that faith thing, that's me. Preacher, I'm just not sure if I were to die today that I would even go to heaven. And on this Mother's Day, there's nothing I would like to know more than where I'm gonna spend eternity. With heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, no one moving around. Can I just ask this question? How many of you'd say, preacher, that's me? I'm just not sure where I would spend eternity if I were to die today. Would you slip your hand up and let me pray for you? I see one hand. Thank you, I see two hands. I see three hands. Is there someone else? Someone else today, just let me pray for you. Anyone else, just slip it up. Let me pray for you, is there anyone else? Thank you, you can put them down. Hands all over the building. In just a minute, we're gonna give you an invitation to come and do business with God. We'll meet you at the front and we'll take the Bible and we'll show you how you can know for sure where you'll spend eternity. Here's the second question I'm gonna ask today and I'm done. Preacher, my faith is a little weak. Preacher, my faith has not been that rock solid faith. I've, I've let some things discourage me. Maybe it's physical pain. Maybe it's physical heartaches. Maybe it's financial trouble in your life. Maybe it's family problems. But preacher, I have allowed some things to shake my faith. Preacher, today on this Mother's Day in 2018, I I wanna get that rock solid faith back. Preacher, pray for me. My faith has been shaken. If that's you, slip your hand up around the building. Slip them up nice and high. Let me pray for you. All around the building, lots of hands, lots of hands. Thank you, you can put them down. In just a minute, we're gonna pray. God's spoken to you. I want you just to come. Kneel at this altar and do business with God. Father, please, I pray that you would work in our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would do something great in us today. Strengthen our faith. Make our faith greater, Lord. Help us not to be detoured. Lord, help us to come to you and Lord, just nail that faith down. All this we ask in Jesus' name, amen.